Welcome to the Whitetail Legacy Podcast. And we get the back view of him. And I mean, it's just a mega. 52 yards is a long shot. Uh, Magnum P.I. is what yeah. we named him. No idea. Just but, a magnum. Yeah, just a magnum. Come on, Cam, last year. We, we said probably 150, mid 150. Yeah. Same Doe from the morning come out with that nine pointer. Here, here steps out this 90 inch eight point. You're like, <laughs> yeah. Ah. I'm like, okay, well, there's still a buck back there grunting. Yeah. And then I steps like another 90 inch eight yeah. point. I'm like, all oh, right. <laughs> yeah. Bro. Yeah. Bro. Yeah. You're like, I'm like, deer right there. Yeah. Like, and he's 30 already yards. 30 yards. Yeah. He, he was literally five yards from the base of the tree. Could have been. I had a buck down at 1.40 in the afternoon back there deep on public. Three does come out pretty early. It was like 2.45, 24 yard shot, sent the combat veteran. And I tell you what, man, dude, it just smoked. We always get so jacked up when the other person kills. It's just almost like we got it done. Yeah. And when you kill that doe, I was like, hell yeah, man. And we come down here to Missouri. My ass called me one more time. I'm like, is it a good buck? And he goes, yeah, real good, solid buck. I'm like, all right, boom. <laughs> and the deer just drops. Sure. Super special to me. All right, let's get into the show. Welcome to the Whitetail Legacy Podcast, coming at you with the legend episode. We know this is a crowd favorite. We got David Shade talking about the what buck? Woo! Woo! The Ric Flair buck is a name. Uh, Flair, actually, but uh, Ric Flair for, for I mean, long it's form. A, it's obviously after Ric yeah, Flair. Yeah, Ric Flair, obviously. <laughs> he, he even said it himself. Yeah, he did. So uh, <laughs> this is a really awesome legend episode. A lot of history with this buck. Guy gets it done on the first time in. I'm not going to give up any more details. You guys just have to listen. Um, get into that veteran VIP broadhead. We're going out. We're going to take the bows out, try to kill some Merriams with the combat veteran. Yes. Can we get it done? What What are your chances, two birds, right now? With a, What's your second one? What is your odds from one to ten that you think you'll kill a second bird? One to ten, six. Yeah. Six? Oh, no, no, hold on, hold on. Oh! What, what was it? What? <laughs> two birds? <laughs> Two birds, yeah, six. Oh, I'm yeah. thinking like three point eight. Mm. After the trail cam pictures we got, two percent Ric Flair cost in there. <laughs> <laughs> like a two two percent Wow factor. Yeah, like a woo. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's that's causing mine to rise up. Yeah, so okay. I'm only point two off. You're only of point two. Yeah. Okay, right. I got you. All right, I got. I'm always accounting for yeah, that. Yeah, you are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, All right, yeah. If you guys haven't checked out the combat veteran turkey season right around the corner, this thing is gonna murder turkeys. If you want to really crush them, shoot the 175s. Yeah, we know some guys are shooting 175s at the crossbow for turkeys. I mean, that just tank. You're just cutting the breast off when you hit them. I mean, <laughs> yeah, you just solid. it's already cut open yeah. for you. <laughs> All right, you got the VIP veteran broadhead shout out. This week's VIP veteran broadhead shout out is. Jason Slocum. Uh, he was in the Navy for 22 years. Said he had various deployments overseas, totaling about two years. Um, and I quote, an ungodly amount of training. <laughs> so um, said with his free time now, he hopes to enjoy the outdoors more and said he's going to check out the show. So Jason, uh, we hope you appreciate the shout out as much as we appreciate your service. Um, 22 two, years is a long time. Yeah, man. man. That is, I mean, that's almost my whole life. So, yeah. Um, we appreciate he that. one trained up mofo. Yeah, I would say <laughs> the, um, like, we just, we're at work. We just run trains. That's all yeah. we do. And we have an ungodly amount of training. I can't imagine the military. Yeah. So, yeah. um, we appreciate you sitting through all that, um, ungodly amount of training and, um, doing what you did for us, man. All right. Let's get into Ingram's outdoor obsession. Something we don't talk about. At Ingram's so very much is his European mounts. He's still doing European mounts, um, and he's crushing them. He's doing elk, bear skulls, mule deer, mule. antelope. Um, I'm gonna get the turkey skull this year. Did we say he not? Did Did we uh, mention he had an Ayu dad come in? No, no. I yeah, think so. he had an Ayu dad come in. All dad. Uh, yeah. Yeah. All dad. Yeah. Same thing. Yeah. Pretty much. All you dad. <laughs> All you, bro. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm going to get a turkey uh, skull European up there. 
Um, you're gonna Miriam, or you're, <laughs> you're gonna European your Miriam. Yes, all, right. all day. I'm all not right. full body man. We're not killing any Easter. Yeah. This year. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not killing any of the backyard, bro. Really counting on Scott to get one tied yeah, up. Yeah. <laughs> all right. All your taxidermy needs, Ingram's outdoor obsession, ECW calls. Are you taking the box call for the Marion? In order to take one, I got to get one, so I'm gonna have to go down there and buy one because I really like the way yours was last year. Yeah, I like um, the volume it had. Man. Yeah, I know in the later part of the season that was really the only call they were responding to. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if it was just a different pitch of it, um, but they just really weren't hitting the mouth calls or the the slate call. Yeah. So the box call late season really was handy, and I feel like um, I want to add that to my arsenal this yeah, year. Yeah, it was a ripper, so that's definitely something to think about. It. Embry Custom Woodworkings for all your turkey call needs and custom call work. Um, the box call is real pretty call, too, and you can get it at multiple different woods. So uh, that's going to be pretty awesome if we take them out there, have a couple box calls, slate calls. You never can have too many calls to no, really try to change no. the variety. With all, with all the setups you got this nowadays, I mean, you got all kinds of pockets for everything. All right, we got Exodus Trail Cams. Yep. Um, like we said last week, guys, um, that sale for the Lift 2, um, you got about 24 hours until that uh, – Sale's going to be done. They're getting real close on the 100 for the Lift 2. Um, remember, there's a five-year no BS warranty. The Lift 2 has a viewing screen, unbelievable video and picture quality. The battery life is amazing. Um, also, their customer support is top-notch. So be sure to hop on that. Spring 20 is the code for about the next 24 hours from this release of this episode um exodusoutdoorgear.com be sure to hit them up on facebook and instagram if you have any questions um they will answer you no problem yeah man i feel like i feel like people the lift too is like a high-end really nice trail cam so if you're looking oh, for something solid. to just get epic videos you know you see those videos you're like man i just my trail cam can't ever pull this off or if you put that there you're gonna get epic pics and epic trail cameras so in my book, it's worth ha spending the money, especially when this deal is going on, to have yes. a couple super solid cams on a scrape on video mode just to get just epic video quality. It's just so cool to have, man. It's so cool. You get to see the way the bucks may be posturing the scrape or acting to other bucks. Super cool. Um, a lot of cameras struggle at nighttime video mode, and the Lift 2 kind of excels in that. So um, great deal. Let's get into next level deer supplements. Did we mention that we're going to hunt Merriam's with next level? Right. We did. We did. <laughs> oh, we did mention sure. that. Big shout out to them for letting us go out there. Um, not a high fence ranch, so that's going to be new for me. I say. <laughs> it, uh, Free right. range Merriam's. I don't even know. I'm glad we got that out here. Yeah. I'm going to have to mark that uh, about six minutes in here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, talking about next level deer supplements, uh, Scott and Nate's mission is to bring a no BS deer mineral to the feed products and feed products to the market for the hardcore blue collar hunter. Um, they don't have any gimmicks and they don't cut corners. Uh, we know that because we get to talk to them on the daily. Yeah, they're just super passionate about giving you the best stuff they can at the cheapest cost so guys can afford to feed their deer what they need. You know what I mean? Instead of this high cost stuff that's filled with attractants you know what i mean yeah. instead of actual beneficial minerals so their um feed is professionally formulated and they're mineral uh with the highest quality ingredients that work but at an affordable cost to you the consumer um if you're ready to take the deer to the next level then go to their website nextleveldeer.com that's nxt level deer.com and find a dealer near, near you um, they are always looking for dealers also, so if you are interested in that, um, check them out there. And um, check them out on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. TikTok. So, nxtleveldeer.com. Get an order in. All right, here's our second shout-out for Carta Maps. Still blown away by this map. Um, pretty solid birthday gift. Um, go ahead and take it away, homie. Yeah, you know, we, we've got it hung up now. We have um, we just did a recent scouting mission on our uh, public land, 
And we've got some spots picked out. And, you know, it's some spots that we had looked at before, but now we can really come back here to the studio and dive deeper into it because we can just look at the map, you know. We don't have to be like, hey, what spot are you looking at and zoom in and zoom out 92 times on a, a digital map. So we can just look at the same spot and then with the with the map that we have is magnetic, gives us a pin, and just put it right on, you know, basically the tree because it's that good of a map you just put it right on the tree that we want to hunt or that we're talking about hunting and then we get a look at everything else you know surrounding it so um on top of that one thing i want to talk about now is like the different overlays that you can get when um getting the different types of maps so you last week we talked about having the standard the outdoor the magnetic and the poster well then you can also have like uh, a topo map or you can have an imagery map so um, they have maps from the forest service from 2013 into 2016 they have the usgs topo map us world and imagery for public lands they have us and world imagery topographic maps uh, they have us and world imagery natural atlas for public lands and the natural atlas for topography so a lot of different options to overlay on your base map and um, customize it the way you want. So very good software on the website, very easy to use, and very easy to customize your map to fit your needs and how you want your map to look when they create it for you. So That's super cool that you can add topo to to it. You know, you can check out the ridges and stuff because you're looking at a flat map, you know what I mean? And yeah. if you don't kind of know the area, it might be a little tough. So and that might be a thing like if you're – gonna go hunt some public land somewhere that you might you you might not know print one of these off you know what i mean you got the topo in it together and then you can literally walk match it up and be like okay i can hunt this tree i'm gonna circle this on this map and you have it in hand on the on the phone is cool but having the topo and that together in hand where multiple guys can look at it at once and it's, it's so much more materialistic when you have it there you know what i mean i'm gonna say this and then we're gonna move on I've never seen Bill Winky zoom in on a phone f to look at a map yeah. or an aerial spot. He's always on a physical map, marking it out with a crayon yeah. or some type of pen, or, you know, a, a thumbtack or something, and actually physically marking that location. And if Bill Winky's into it, I should probably be into it. <laughs> you know what there I mean? You go. So check them out, cardamaps.com. That's, who, that's who's going to knock it out for us. All right, man. Let's get into the show. All right, guys, we got a good legend episode coming at you. We got David Shade coming on. How you doing tonight, man? Good, good, man. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, I appreciate you coming on. Like I said, I cold messaged you, but you had already listened to the podcast, I guess, and uh, already had kind of known what we were about. But I, I love it when I just cold message someone and they're like, yeah, yeah, I'll come on. I'm like, man, that's awesome because that's what we're all about, trying to get those untold stories of those giant deer you know, that you see on social media or something. And the first thing I think about, like, man, I wonder, you know, did they have any history with it? What's the story behind that? And that's, this is our outlet to let people see these pictures and be like, oh, I can finally know the whole story. Yeah. So super, super cool that you, you decided to come on and share your story with people because these giant deer, I feel like it, they're almost deserved, you know, the story to be told. So great. Well, and, and, and so, and obviously my name's David Shade and I, I, and I've had a, a lot of success here in the last, you know, decade or so hunting in Ohio, but I don't live in Ohio. I live in, in Maryland, which, you know, we were talking kind of pre-show you and I about, you know, a lot of success the last 10 years or so. And really that coincides with starting to hunt more in Ohio. And I almost, I don't hunt at all back where I live anymore. And and really that, that kind of is what kind of tipped the scale as far as when I started putting in all of my time hunting, um, where big bucks live, as opposed to maybe spending a week there a year. Yeah. We don't hear a lot about Maryland as, as whitetail, you know what I mean? We were, we were talking about that the other day where we were yeah. like, you never hear anything like Maine, Maryland, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like there's not a lot of, it doesn't seem like there's. I know that the deer size isn't as big out there, so I could understand where you're going to Ohio and 
I mean, the well, last few I, years in Ohio have just been incredible, man. Everybody's just killing giant deer down there. It has. And, and you know, before I, I would take a week and come to where you, I'd come to Illinois, I'd come to Iowa, I'd come to Kansas. But, you know, I was always like, you know, I'd like to find something where I can do it year round. And you know, like everybody, you know, that's what I'm interested in. I'm, I'm interested in managing it year round. And, you know, the really the first place, the first the first good place when you start to head west is Ohio. And uh, so I, I kind of just fell into some really good properties in southern Ohio, which which southern Ohio doesn't look a lot like sort of the rest of Ohio. It's sort of Ohio River hill country, not a lot of ag. And it really kind of mirrors where I grew up here maryland border of west virginia you know we we don't have a lot of ag here it's mostly big woods mountains so it, it, it's very similar to what i grew up hunting and i and i felt comfortable out there hunting you know right off the get-go yeah we say that a lot we feel like if we went to another state and it wasn't ag strips of timber in between you know maybe a big chunk of timber here or there we'd just be lost you like on a mountain like how do you pin these deer down so i feel like i'd be the same way i'd try to kind of gravitate to something i knew that i might have an advantage of that i could kind of figure it out so i'd be right there with you man if i found a lease that was like oh yeah this is kind of like what i'm hunting i'd i'd probably jump on that compared to you know, if, if I wasn't used to hunting flat ag ground, it, it's kind of intimidating, you know, it, whatever you're not used to hunting. And, and I'm used to hunting elevation. And, and and when I go somewhere where it's flat, it, it kind of throws me off. And, and I even say that when I travel, like if I go somewhere it's flat, I don't have my sense of directions off. I don't know what it is, but I'm used to when I go somewhere, if a mountain's on my left side, then I know it's going to be on my right side when I'm coming back. So I'm used I'm used to hunting elevation as more so than anything yeah flat ground kind of throws me but um you know when i really kind of put all in when i said you know from here on out i have x amount of days to hunt a year i'm gonna hunt them in ohio that's that's really when when my success rates started to go and and you hear people say it all the time you, you can't kill what's not there and and hey, that that is you know that's just the absolute truth if you know if you really want to if you really want to hunt big bucks you got to hunt where they're at and and if you want to go all in, sometimes you just say, that's where I'm going to spend my time hunting. Yeah, it's it's hard to bounce around and figure out 10 different places or a couple different states. But if you can put all your eggs in one basket and it's a good basket and it's going to hold those eggs, then that's the way to go. You know what I mean? And you picked Ohio and it seems like you're really figuring out that ground and having some really good success. I mean, killed an absolute giant typical and killed an absolute giant non-typical that we're going to talk about on this episode um, so it seems like you're really putting the pieces together there. And like we always say, once you kind of figure out a property, it seems like it's, once you're successful on it, you're going to continue to be successful. So I'm excited to follow you and, and see what you do the next few years. Well, and it's, and it's about four and a half hours for me. And I I'd say that's about, you know, I'm, I wish it was a little closer, but it's a manageable distance that, you know, in the summertime I can make a day trip out of it. And, and I, and I spend a lot of time out there and, and anybody that knows me knows that, you know, most weekends I'm hard to pin down because I'm probably in Ohio. So it's, you know, I, I, it, it takes, well, you guys know it. I mean, it takes a lot of time and it's not something you can just show up out there in the rut and, and hope one walks by. I mean, people get lucky like that all the time, but it certainly takes, it takes the effort to year round, you know, pattern those deer. Absolutely. With the elevation there, are you able to, you know, put in any food plots or anything on your property? Um, we have a few small ones um, in different places, uh, but for the most part, there's it's mostly big woods, clear cuts, pine thickets, creek bottoms. It's it's there's not a lot of places. There's we have a few, uh, you know, probably the biggest we have is maybe an acre, two acre food plots, and they do. They do draw the deer. Um, I mean, by the by the end of the fall, they're just eight down to the mud. Uh, you know, probably where I killed, you know, these two deer, you know, there's probably not an ag field for five miles in any direction. It's it's just, you know, it's it's I hesitate calling it big woods, but it really is. It's 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 a lot of thick woods and there's just a lot of cover. And it's no wonder, you know, those deer out, you know, this the the non-typical I killed, we had five years of history with him and he was at least eight and a half is, is probably, I didn't get his teeth aged. I wish I had, but I, I, 
at least eight and a half. It's no wonder the A's that those bucks get on them out there in that country. Yeah, I could definitely be. I mean, even to get a trail picture on on a picture or on a piece of ground that big, you know, it would be hard to pin down. This is where I'm going to put my cam. Mm. You know what I mean? So, <laughs> so I think those deer can go hidden, and you always see on social media like around that area someone just pull a giant deadhead out that no one has oh, yeah. any clue, you know, like this is 240 <laughs> inch deer, you know, deadhead. It's it, been dead for five years. Like how in the hell did someone not find that? So. And every year I get pictures of a buck. I'll get a picture in the rut. One, one couple of series of pictures of him and never see him again. And you don't know where they come from. You don't know where they go, but you know, there's lots of big clear cuts out there that, you know, it's, it's really industrial timberland, you know, a lot of it's owned by big timber companies and, you know, they'll come in and clear cut 70, 80, 90, a hundred acres, just, just completely clear cut it. And it looks awful when they do it, but it, it's super beneficial for the wildlife. And after a couple of years, it's so thick, you can't walk through it. And, you know, that, that's the kind of places that those, they find those deadheads in there laying that just lay in there for years and nobody, nobody goes in there looking. Yeah. Yeah. The, those big bucks, they like the thickest, nastiest spot they can find to get away from people and to feel comfortable. But we've been, uh, we've been hinting around this giant non-typical here. Um, I'm excited to hear the story of, uh, Flair, which is AKA <laughs> Rick Flair, which is a super solid name. So, um, I'm kind of jealous that you named that before I named a buck that, <laughs> but, but, uh, let's, let's get into the story of this buck. Okay. Um, so, and I didn't name, I, I, I'll, I'll take no credit for the name. I didn't, uh, I didn't name him Flair. That was another, uh, that was another guy, um, on the property. And we have a lease down there. It's about 1400 acres. And there's six of us, uh, that have been in the club. And there's another guy on the lease named, uh, Jason, who, who he's actually who named the deer. He was hunting this deer really hard for, uh, three years. And, uh, he actually had, the deer one night um at about 35 yards right at dark and and didn't have a shot but i'll back up farther when we uh one of the first years we got the lease i found a shed that was off the deer i killed that would have been 2000 that would have been 2014 i found the shed off my deer and at that point he was like a 140 inch nine point and he uh we had some trail camera pictures of him on a scrape that year. Uh, one guy had seen him in the stand, but uh, didn't pass him. And really, we had bigger bucks on on the lease that year. And he really wasn't he really wasn't in anybody's target buck that that first year. But that was the first year we knew about him, and that would have been uh, 2014. Um, 2015, no sightings, but nobody was hunting in the area that that he we eventually i eventually killed him or where we eventually got a lot of pictures of him just nobody was up on our, that northern part of the lease uh 2016 he came in and was as big or bigger maybe than he than the year i killed him um he was on the far northern part of the lease uh the other member jason had a number of pictures of him on trail cam now we never had any pictures of this deer in velvet. He showed up every year around the 20th of October. Um, I don't know exactly where he came from. And he usually disappeared sometime around the beginning of January. Uh, we have that one shed off of him. But as far as I know, we never had any pictures of him after that. Um, I was hunting, mostly hunting different bucks almost all the time that this deer was on the property. I, I rarely hunted um, on that far northern part. Uh, as I said, Jason hunted hunted this deer. When he first showed up back in 16, I, I think he might have been not as heavy, but maybe had more time left back in 16. Uh, Jason had an encounter with him uh, at a scrape right at dark, uh, no shot, but continued to get pictures of him all fall. Um, never saw him again. Had um, a bunch of daylight pictures of him, uh, I think right before Thanksgiving that year, chasing a doe. Of course, he wasn't there hunting, uh, but chasing a doe all around his stand. 
man, man, that's that much history with an absolute giant. So you're, you're so he was two fourteen, right? When you when you killed him, two twelve, two twelve. So do you think uh, he was two twenty or so in sixteen? Yeah, or I, I think he was probably close to two twenty. I, I it's hard to tell. I think I think his I think his main beams weren't quite as long in sixteen, but I think he had better time length. And I'm not sure he was quite as heavy, but he was he was just an absolute an absolute stunner he was he was he was something else now i was out hunting the big typical on the other end of the property so i really wasn't you know i really wasn't even you know i it was great and i was really hoping jason would get a shot at him but i really that i really like i said i didn't i wasn't even hunting on that part of the property so it really didn't even i didn't think too much about him other than i just thought he was great now at the end of 16, Jason had uh, pulled out. Um, he usually would just come out and hunt for, he's from back in here in Maryland. He would just come out and usually hunt for two weeks in November and then be done. Um, so late in, late in 16, I put a camera up and I got some pictures of him um, in late December. And uh, I was just trying to, you know, get some pictures of him in a little different area than where he was. But I did get some pictures of him up through right before muzzleloader season in January, and then he disappeared. So at that point, I didn't know, did somebody get him a muzzleloader on another property? Um, you know, the, the very northern part where he was at is kind of, it's kind of a kind of a point that goes up with other properties around it. So, you know, I really wasn't sure if somebody got him or, or what it was. Um, now, the summer of 2017, uh, we had a pretty bad EHD kill in Ohio. And so while we didn't really seem to lose any bucks on that property that summer, when this deer came back in 17, he had really dropped. Uh, and he had probably dropped 30, 40 inches. Maybe he was, I, 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 he was probably, I mean, still a great deer, but probably he went from a, a down to a nine point, with a lot of junk, um, I'm guessing he might have been one, maybe upper 180s, 190 in 2017. So he took a big drop off of 16. And of course, you know, we all thought, well, you know, is he going downhill? You know, we've had, we've had him, we've had this deer on the property now for four years. So, you know, is he going downhill? So we really didn't, really weren't sure, you know, what he was doing. Now in 17, he really started using a lot of different areas. He wasn't out on the northern part of the property um, near as much as he was, and he he moved down more into the central part of the property, and and he was also going across the road. Uh, another hunter started getting with Tom was starting to get a lot of pictures of him. So all of a sudden, it seemed like his range expanded. Um, he went downhill in antlers, but we started we started getting pictures of him in a lot of different places. Man, that's crazy how, so in my mind, I'd be like, man, this deer's probably seven, you know, he's going down here, hill, you know, he's never gonna, and for him to come back, I wonder like if he, you know, some people say that they can contract EHD and just not die from it, you know, and just carry it for a while. Just get sick. So I wonder if he was just sick and it stunted his growth just enough that's, to. That's kind of what I, that's kind of my theory on it. I, I didn't, somebody else said that to me though. I, that wasn't, I didn't think that at first. It just seemed like, I thought like you guys, like, ah, oh, he's just going downhill. That's too bad. I wish he would have got him the year before. Um, so, you know, and then it sort of ended the season. Nobody, you know, nobody got a shot at him, um, in 17. 17 was then, the year that you killed the typical, right? Or was that the year before? That was the year before. Yeah. So and you, then, You'd then, already uh, killed a hundred. Is that one hundred eighty-four inch typical, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. So you killed a hundred eighty-four inch typical on the south. So you're, you're thinking, good. man, this you're south good. is pretty solid. You <laughs> right. know, I mean, I mean, I might just hang down here. <laughs> Jason just needs to kill right. his two hundred up there. Yeah. Two thousand sixteen is pretty decent year. Yeah. And uh, so, so you know, we all were kind of like, you know, and I looked hard for that deer sheds because he really expanded his territory in seventeen, and and he was in a lot of different spots. He was using a big pine thicket a lot, so really looked for sheds and again he kind of always disappeared about he'd show up in october and disappear in january said so i really don't know i don't know where i still don't really know where he was going he always first showed up on the northern part of the property so really i always felt like he was coming from that direction um but when he showed back up in 18 um 
I mean, we were just, we were just blown away. I mean, he, he just jumped right back up and really the EHD is, I, I can't remember who kind of came at, told me that, told me that. And I thought, you know, that, that's a good explanation as any of why he took a big drop and then, and then, and then a big jump back up. But, uh, when he came back in 18, he was just, he was unbelievable. I mean, he was just heavy. And, and I remember just talking to some friends, you know, and I'd send them a picture and we'd talk while I was driving back from Ohio at night after checking cams. And we'd just talk about, you know, what do you think this deer is? You think he's 200? You think he's 215? You think he's 220? I mean, it was just, he was just, it was just unbelievable. Yeah. From your profile picture, you can't really tell, but then if you go through the pictures and you get that side view of when you actually got the picture of him in the field, you can see how heavy he is. Like even his tines are heavy, you know, and and kind of bladed and, and, out. Uh, both beams were, uh, but both both beams. I think uh, one main beam was twenty nine and and seven, and the other was twenty nine and two. So both main beams really long. Yeah, that's why when I seen the first deer, the first picture, <laughs> I was like, man, those main beams are giant. And when you get past yeah. that, like twenty seven inch, twenty eight inch mark, you know your the points are adding up quick. Then you know, what I mean, and then he's got all that base stuff going on. You get a trail cam picture of him, you're like, man, is the trail cam playing tricks on me? Is it like <laughs> blowing it up on the angle? What do I got going on? And even with velvet, he's got all those flyers and stuff. It's hard to add the math, do the math to add up the points to figure out what he's going to be. So, so, so I'll kind of go in now to sort of the year I hunted him and I was again I was hunting a different buck there was a another non-typical that that I ended up I had the shed off of um and he was probably somewhere in the 180s um as a non-typical and I was actually hunting that deer I I I really this deer was not on my radar um the other that other deer was a pretty regular at one of my stands and I was hunting that deer so I was uh, out there for I took 10 days in November I was out there hunting and the deer I was hunting disappeared completely disappeared and I just had a really slow kind of nine ten days um, and there's a video on my Facebook page and I don't know if you see this so the last day I was there second to last day it was pouring down rain and I thought well I'm not going to sit here in this rain I'm going to I'm going to take a little walk and put up some trail cameras and I thought you know I, I can come back out after Thanksgiving and, and bow hunt another week before gun season so I grabbed a couple cameras and I decided I was just going to take a hike up into a spot that I hadn't been up into before. I've been up there before, but I'd never really hunted it. So I, I hiked up and it's, it's just pouring rain. I mean, just, it's a gully washer. It's just drowning me. And uh, I didn't have a bow or anything. And I just had on, had on just jeans and I had a couple trail cameras with me and I go walking up and I get up on top of this little ridge. And there's an old field that's not on our property. And then you come down this open ridge and then the ridge kind of, kind of narrows up and it gets rocky. And then there's a drop off and the ridge continues. And, uh, I was down at the end of that ridge and, um, Jason, his stand was about where he would get in the deer. He wasn't getting, didn't get him near as much in 2018 as he did before, but that that scrape was out on the point of that ridge about 600 yards from where i was and uh, i was standing there in the rain i looked up and i just saw antlers coming through the wood and and it was him and i just i, I mean it was the biggest buck i'd ever seen in the wild i mean it was unbelievable and so i crouched down beside a tree and, and got my iphone out of my pocket and started videoing him now i'm just in jeans and i don't have a bow or anything and he's just he's just coming up the ridge coming right at me and i got about I don't know, 20 seconds of video of him um, coming up that ridge before he kind of stopped and saw me crouched down by, behind that tree. And uh, it was just unbelievable. And I, and I don't know if I sent you that video, but I can. But that was the first time I actually saw him. And that's, that's the spot I, I actually eventually killed him in December. So um, after I saw him, um, I got a trail cam up and I got out of there. Now, I still wasn't, I still wasn't sure. And a couple of people said, well, I'd have put a stand up there that day. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I was kind of thinking of it more like a long game. I really wasn't thinking, oh, I'm going to come back here and kill this deer. I kind of thought, 
okay, I'm starting to piece the puzzle together a little bit because I knew I knew where the where the kind of the community scrape was, it was way down on the end of the scrape, on the end. And I knew another guy in the lease across the holler across the road was getting pictures of him as well. Um, so it stood to reason he was crossing this ridge somewhere. This ridge ran north south. So I knew I knew from from one point where Jason was getting pictures to where the other guy was getting pictures. Well, I mean, he had to cross this ridge somewhere. Now, the question was, you know, where was he crossing? If you walked up this ridge, there was not a rub. There wasn't a scrape. There was nothing. Um, so I put a camera up and I, I started getting pictures of him. And most of the pictures um, were always right before daylight. And, um, and you know, as good a pattern as you can get, you know, maybe every five, six days I would get him crossing that spot. And so, but always right before daylight, usually sometime between an hour before daylight to right at daylight, he was crossing that spot. Um, and I still, I still really hadn't, didn't have it pinned down. Um, so I kept the camera up and I still didn't hunt it. I just, I kept the camera up and I still get pictures of him and I was kind of just kind of planning out, you know, what I was going to do. Um, so kind of fast forward now into December, um, I decided to go out the weekend, um, of New Year's Eve, and I thought, well, I'm going to go out muzzle loaders the next weekend. I'm going to go out check some cameras, um, maybe put up a stand, and then just kind of get things prepared to hunt the following week, which was muzzle loader, which I had off. So when I got out there, um, I was talking to one of the neighbors uh, who who was down over the road, and the first thing he told me was, he said, "Well, I've been getting some some pictures of a really big deer with a drop tine down here in my food plot at night." Now, I didn't know he had a food plot. You couldn't see it from the road. But that was kind of the, the last puzzle piece that that kind of that I said, OK, he's over in that food. Plot. That's where he's coming from. He's in that food plot at night and he's coming back around. He's crossing this ridge right before daylight and then heading back over into that pine thicket uh, during the day where the other guys getting the pictures of him. So all of a sudden it was like the points all kind of connected and. And that's, that's, it, I mean, how often does that actually happen? Uh, <laughs> not very often, but it happened on this one. Lucky you talked to that neighbor, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. That neighbor yeah. made a slip, didn't he? <laughs> well, so. and he's not really a deer hunter, so no. it didn't really, it didn't really make a lot of difference to him. Um, so he's more of a coon hunter, so it didn't make a lot of difference to him. So once I talked to him, then I went in with a stand and I took the stand in and, and, it was a big open ridge and I was like, well, I can either go high or I can go for cover. And I decided to go with cover and I probably was only up like 16, 17 feet, but I got tucked in real tight to a little cedar tree. And I, 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 I was in my lone wolf. I took it in and hung it. Um, that was a Friday evening. I went in there and hung, um, hung it. And so the next day, and remember, I said the ridge kind of runs north south, um, and he was coming from the east and going to the west, so he was kind of crossing it, you know, at you know straight across. So um, the next day, I didn't hunt it; I stayed out of there. And then uh, Sunday morning, which was December thirtieth, uh, there was a light north wind, and I thought, well, it's, I'm going to go in there and sit and and give it a shot. And I I've been getting, like I said, I've been getting pictures of him in there you know, every five, six days or so. So, you know, it was anything but a given, but it, it but it was a perfect morning. It was kind of frosty. Um, I parked uh, about a mile away and I, I, I just took my time and walked in and, um, you know, I sat there for about the first hour and I, and this is another funny part of it. I almost didn't get up and go. I, it, the night before was the college football semifinals. And I think, I think it was Alabama and Oklahoma, but I stayed up and watched the whole game and it wasn't over till like 1230. And I was like, Oh man, I, I just, I don't know if I'm gonna get up and go. And I thought, no, get up and go. I had to come back home that day anyway. So I thought just go hunt for a few hours and then, then I'll hop in the truck and I'll head home, you know, be back for New Year's Eve. Um, so anyway, I hiked in, it was perfect. I didn't bump any deer. 
uh, got up in the stand. I had to break a couple cedar branches off once I got up there just to be able to see anything. I was, I, you know, I was really tucked in tight. And, uh, you know, about 8.15, uh, I heard something and looked off, down off the ridge. And, and here he came. And, I mean, it was, it was just so surreal to see that deer again. I mean, it just, it, it, those antlers didn't even look, it just didn't even look right on his head. <laughs> He's, he's just cruising up the ridge right at you. The trail cam pictures that you've been getting, were they around that time or were they, you said they were right before daylight. So that was yeah. al- almost probably an hour after, right? It was, it was. And I was sitting there thinking, yeah, you know, I guess this ain't going to be the day because I really expected if I was going to see him, it's going to be right at first light. And he was actually with a spike. That's, that's a funny part of the story, but I don't know why. But uh, he was with a spike and uh, letting the spike and clear the way is what he was doing. Yeah. <laughs> Go he, out there, and, young buck. <laughs> and he came exactly, you know, where I, I'm sure he was down in that food plot um, at that night. And he came exactly the way that that, you know, I, I thought he would come. And I actually didn't even let him get all the way up on top of the ridge to where I was getting the pictures. I once he once he came into an opening, uh, sort of still down off the ridge a little bit. I he's about thirty five yards, and I took the shot. I, I didn't even, um, you know, he he was kind of looking up in there at me. I don't think he there was no way he could see me, and I had I had a perfect wind, so you know it was. And again, it was just you know the first time in is is you know, so important. I, you know, those, once you hunt a stand a couple of times, seems like they can really start to figure you out. And he had, he just had no idea that, that I was in there. Yeah. He'd been cruising through there multiple times. He's thinking, ah, I'm good to go. And then he maybe looked, man, that cedar tree looks a little different, but I probably <laughs> still stall it. <laughs> yeah. He, but. he probably been cruising there for, through there for years. And like I said, it, it finally kind of all clicked together that, he had to be crossing this ridge somewhere be based on where the guys were getting pictures and, and I, it had to be somewhere. And then once, once I started getting pictures of him, then it made sense how he was crossing this ridge and, and I'll try to describe it, but when he would come up, he would have about 80 yards of open ridge that he could look. And then there was a little bit of a steep, rocky drop off to his other side so when he would cross there, you know, he could look and see anything. And then he had his wind protecting his other side, you know, and then he crossed right over, right over the, the narrow part of the ridge and down into a big greenbrier thicket. So it was, it, and that's exactly where I videoed him in November in that heavy rain going right across the same spot. Like, like we always hear, man, it seems like these big, big giant bucks, they, figure out a spot that they're safe at they might not u- utilize it all the time but if you see them there once there's a reason they're there and the yeah. reason they're using that access so it's definitely a good place like you said you hung a camera and then you realize okay this deer's using this a little bit more than i thought this wasn't just a fluke you know he was here one time because like a lot of times i feel like you see a buck one time somewhere you're like ah it's just the rut or he's just here you know on a doe or something but that could be a spot that he utilizes you know frequently so um. yeah absolutely and 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 if you walk that ridge say in february or march and and we're looking for sign you would see none there there was not a, a there was he didn't leave one bit of sign where he was crossing that ridge the best place to me and homie that hunted this year there's like one tree rub mm-hmm. on a 15 acre little piece and nothing else but bucks all over the place I feel yeah, like it's, it's, I feel like they make funny. that sign. There, there's a little bit of sign right on the doe bedding, but I feel like they, I don't know. I feel like all that signs nocturnal, and it's just like a signpost for other deer. And I know a lot of people have luck hunting over it, but if it's not an active, active scrape, I just haven't had mm. any luck. So. Yeah, I I agree. And and like I said, the biggest thing was I I kind of saw him there, and that's really what started tying the puzzle together. And then. You know, when the neighbor said, yeah, I saw him down in the food plot. And then I kind of knew where the other guys in the lease had been getting pictures. And then it, it and you just you just kind of start connecting the dots and saying, well, he's got to be crossing this somewhere. And of course, when I went up there in the rain and actually got a look at him, I mean, that that changed everything. Oh, yeah. You're like, ah, man, this south isn't as sweet now. <laughs> I've got a real look at this deer. You know what I mean? So, but but uh, 
and it was a spot really nobody uh you know nobody in the lease was hunting that spot at all it was just a a, a very hard spot to get to unless you really wanted to walk uh a long way to get to it just because of the way it set the elevation it was right on the top of a ridge unless you wanted to walk straight up or walk a long way on the level which is what i chose um uh, it, it was just a hard spot to get to that's why he was there no one else was hunting it he found a pinch in between the food to the bedding that no one was there man and and you put the pieces together and that's something that me and homie like to do we like to look at i feel like some people get a picture of one spot and they're like oh i got a picture of a giant buck but they don't start putting the pieces together like okay why was this deer here what do you think he's doing? And then when you start doing that, that's when stuff starts clicking in your brain. And for most of us, the our ideas of what they're doing is probably bullshit. But at least it gets <laughs> you thinking, you know what I mean? Like, right. he could possibly be doing this. And then you do that, okay, I was completely wrong. You know, and now, now at least you've eliminated that area. I feel like people get one picture of a buck. They hunt that area. Oh, he's not here. He's not here. I don't know why. I'm getting pictures of him, you know. But he's, if he's, he's got he's got a couple routes that he's probably using, and if it's not the rut, that's what he's utilizing. If he's not getting right. bumped, and like I said, I I'd only get him every five or six days. So you know what was he doing the other five? I, I I don't know. I don't know where he was. I don't know what he was doing. Um, but I do know when he crossed that ridge, he would drop into a big kind of southwest facing greenbriars. Um, and I think he I think he probably spent a lot of time bedded. Uh, there was a bench with a lot of green briars, kind of a southwest facing slope. And I, I think that's probably where he spent a lot of time bedded, is my guess. And for whatever reason, that morning, he was just a little bit late going back across for, for you know, for whatever reason. From the pictures, it looks like his horns were pretty dark. Were they pretty dark all the way up? Yeah, they were. They were, uh, they were actually very dark and, uh. Um, I, uh, we talked to a guy on the podcast a couple episodes ago. It just blew my mind that I never like related this, but he was like, you know, I feel like the bucks that have darker antlers bed in heavier, denser areas where they don't get as much sun or they only come out at night. Uh, I, I agree. I agree with that. I've never thought that before. And then when he said that, I'm like, that makes complete sense to me. (laughs) You know what I mean? Because like if a shed drops in the sun, boom, it gets white white after a while. You know what I mean? So I'm sure like if you got a deer that's like bedded, you know, kind of like an open, more ridgy timber or something like a younger buck, they got white antlers. But if you find like a big old giant buck, they seem to have darker antlers and it's either... And another friend of mine was here the other day looking at looking at him, and he commented the same thing. And he said, you know, he hunts down on the eastern shore of Maryland, uh, which is a lot of big ag, a lot of marsh. And uh, he said all the deer down there have, like, real, real white racks. And, and I think it's just what you said. I think it's how much time they spend out in the sun. Yeah, and that, that just, like, clicked in my brain. That's one thing about running the podcast. It's so cool. Like, that smallest detail, you could be like, okay – the buck I got on trail cam has a really dark rack. So this probably is, this buck's bedded where he's not getting any sun. So that eliminates a lot of area, at least for around us. You know what I mean? Like there's spots like if it's November, like late November and he still has a dark rack, you got to think, <laughs> man, this thing's in some, some dense cover somewhere. Just like that yep. 10 pointer in the snow. That thing's like yeah. chocolate is chocolate. That picture that we got from the Exodus. Yeah. I mean, it, it's just like that deer is bedded somewhere where it's dense or it's not coming out in daylight very much. You know what I mean? So when he said that, that clicked me. And just like you said that he's bedded in that briar thicket, spending most of the time there, people aren't going in there for one. And then that just coincides with, he's got a dark rack. So he's in there in the shade and the sun's not getting to him. And the other, the other place the guy was getting a lot of pictures of him was in the middle of about a 70 acre pine thicket. So yeah, he, he spent a lot of time in, in thick, thick places. Yeah. So in that pine thicket, you know, there's no, no sun, hardly any sun in that. So going to give you that, that dark chocolate rack. So it's cool in my brain that that finally connected. Now I'm going to use that tactic and it might not work, (laughs) but it's just one more thing in my arsenal. Be like, 
Because if you look at Freeze, mm-hmm. he's dark. Like, yeah. where was he bedded that was that dark? Like, I have no idea. We know he wasn't yeah. bedded on us because yeah. there was nothing that was that thick. You know what I mean? So... But, the most open timber ever. Yeah, the most open timber <laughs> ever, you know what I mean? So it's just cool. But you look at the other bucks I've killed out there, they're pretty yeah. light, you know yeah. what I mean? This, for, this one here is really. For early October, you know what I mean? They're they're really light. So it's cool to piece the piece the stuff together and just the little minute things that you can learn um, from a deer activity. So I think a lot of things went into it, man. You you putting the work in, driving that far to hunt these giant bucks. I mean, four and a half hours, and then hunting for ten days, and driving back four and a half hours, or or going down there pulling trail cameras and driving back. I mean, that's that's a ton of work. So props to you, man. You it seems like you've definitely earned earned that buck. Yeah, it's uh yeah, and you know, and like I said, it was it was the first time I ever hunted the deer that I killed him, and 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 honestly, I mean other guys hunted him a whole lot more than I did. And, and now that I kind of pieced it together, I did. Now was luck involved. Absolutely. Anytime you kill big buck, you know, it, it, you, there's some element of luck involved, you know, why was he an hour late going back across that Ridge that morning? And so, yeah, there's a lot of it involved, but you know, I, I spend a lot of time out there and I, I, you know, I've met that neighbor. And so, but, it, but so anyway, I think I got up right to when I shot him. Um, and like I say, it's about 35 yards and, as soon as I shot, I thought I missed him. It just, it didn't have the thunk, like the sound. And I was like, oh, you got Oh, God. <laughs> and, but he took off down the ridge, and just before he got out of sight, I saw him go down. And I thought, oh, 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 I did hit him. And so, uh, of course, then, you know, I could see him down there. I, could, I, saw, I, I saw him go down. I saw him dead within sight, you know, maybe 100 and, 20 yards you know it's december so you can see you know it's a long way down over the hill out through the woods and um so i had a heck of a time just getting out of the tree i was i was shook up and uh i got down there to him and i mean i was just just blown away and i was telling you i think right before that he had about a six inch flyer off his back g2 that I'm pretty sure he broke off on the death run and i, I never did find it um the some of the other pictures we have we have pictures of him um, with that flyer on, and it was a real fresh break. Now, I can't tell you he had it when I shot him. I, I just, I, I can't, I can't remember in my mind. I, I just Too many trying points, not, man. <laughs> <laughs> trying not to look at him, and um, but just you know, unbelievable. And then you know, I mentioned the neighbor earlier. I, I, I went down. You know, I'd walked about a mile to get to this spot. Well, you kind of skirt the neighbor's property to come around into it. But the neighbor's property was only, you know, 150 yards, you know, away. So I stopped over at his house, and uh, he was nice enough to fire up his side by side, and we were we drove right up to the deer and loaded it up. It, it really worked out nice. Man, props to the neighbor. Solid too. neighbor. Yeah, solid neighbor. So yeah, yeah, great guy. Like I said, he's not really, you know, he's more of a coon hunter and stuff. So you know, good, good guy. He um, he had some really great sheds of another deer. Uh, the deer I was hunting that I told you that I kind of disappeared that, that other, that other deer I was hunting, he had sheds from that deer from a couple of years ago that were just unbelievable, um, that his dogs had brought into his house. So, you know, he, he keeps an eye on, you know, he knows what's around there. That's a good guy to yeah. know, man. The farmers that drive around ain't got much <laughs> to do that time of year is the best kind to know. You know what I mean? The, but, the... You know, that, that little that chunk of southern Ohio down there, kind of west of the Scioto River, over toward Adams County, and I mean it's just uh, down in there, the Shawnee State Forest. It's you know there's really no ag, and, and the genetics are just, I mean it's it's just it's just unbelievable to be what what grows down in there. Yeah, man, we that there's been absolute giants just coming out of Ohio for it's going to surpass <laughs> yeah it's, it's be, gotta be it's gonna it's be just, number one yeah it's gonna be number one soon because it's just so many absolute giant bucks coming out of there so but i want to go back to uh 2017 when he started kind of leaving or you know covering more ground um we said you know he might have possible ehd um or did was he kind of wandering towards the neighbor and like maybe that was the first year the neighbor had the food plot in down there or, 
or, um, you know, he was getting older and they say, you know, as the big bucks get older, they kind of start, you know, becoming a little less careless, exploring more, getting out of their normal range. Um, uh, actually he started going more onto our property. He came down more into the central part of our property from the, he was always kind of up on that Northern tip. And, uh, we started getting him a lot more down kind of on the central part of the property um in that that year and that that was that was surprising to me um and it and it continued into 18 um we got some pictures of him guys got some pictures of him on cameras in 18 that they had never gotten him before ever that he you know and sometimes it was just you know i had a picture of him at one of my stands that i had never ever gotten a picture of him and one night in November during a snowstorm, I got, he showed up and I got a couple pictures of him and had never, ever, ever, ever. And I'd had a camera up at that spot for, I mean, all the time had never gotten a picture of him. And so, yeah, it seemed like, it seemed like he expanded his range kind of more down, down onto our lease, uh, for the last couple of years. And he was, I mean, he was no, you know, he was no stranger to, I mean, a guy, a lot of guys had, they like pictures of him. I mean, he, a lot of people have pictures of him. He, he was no stranger to, to moving around and walking in front of cameras. It's got to be there. <laughs> Crazy how those deer survive, man. That many, that many people out in the woods. It's I mean, just if you just think there. eight guys know about him, just, just eight, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, it's got to be their yeah. nose and. And he's a magnum. So yeah. like, you and, know, them guys like the, are itching. Yeah. And, and we don't know where he, somebody's got some velvet picture of him that I bet he looks just unbelievable in velvet, <laughs> but I, I've never, I've never seen him, but somebody had to be getting some velvet pics of him. I don't know where he was in the summertime. I mean, we're probably, you know, as the crow flies like five or six miles, um, you know, off the Ohio river. So maybe he was down there along the, along the river in the summertime. I don't know. I would say it, We've learned these last couple of years, um, you know, two, three miles isn't anything for these bucks and, um, bucks go, go farther than that, I'm sure. And, uh, the, the what, what was it? Arkansas or Alabama or Mississippi, somewhere down there did that study and that deer was traveling like 23 miles, yeah. two years yeah. in a row traveled 23 miles. So y- you never know what they can do. I mean, no, it's yeah. a wild free range we animal. Have, we have bucks on cam almost four miles from like October 12th to November, uh, you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, like it's almost a dead month. Yeah, so it's like, man, this deer went four miles from where he was summering early October to where he's rutting. You know what I mean? So it's hard to tell where that deer was, but I'm sure there's some guy out there that's like, I'm oh, I got this velvet pick, so I'm gonna kill. It's just like sidekick, <laughs> like that absolute oh, yeah. giant buck we get and on he's velvet. Two miles away. He's just go, just <laughs> so far away. It's not even close to being killable. And you just want him within a sixty yard circle to have like you know a legit encounter with him, let alone be thirty five yards to kill him. You know what I mean? Like it's just yeah. it's just amazing when everything comes together that you get it done. Yeah, I would rather have <laughs> hard horn pictures in October than velvet <laughs> pictures all day. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Right, exactly. Because those velvet, those velvet pics are awesome, but man, those deer—they might be two counties over. You know yep, what I mean? Yep. Yeah, yeah. I, and I'm sure somebody's probably got some pictures of him in velvet. I'd love to see him, but I, I, I'd like to just know where they got him at, how far he was traveling. Because, like I said, we never, never got a picture of him in velvet. Well, maybe you'll get some text messages after this episode <laughs> comes out. Yeah, maybe so. Maybe somebody's like, like yeah. I got a picture of that deer. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, he was, uh, he was something and we, we got him, uh, you know, really, like I said, in 16, he showed up and that's when they gave him the name flair. He was a regular on this big community scrape that was kind of on this old logging road. And, uh, we have a lot of good videos of him and, uh, he, he was, he was, he, he was a legend of the least. That, that's, that's the truth. And, you know, it was kind of, you know, I don't want to say sad, but it, you know, it was kind of the end of an era. It's always know, sad. I, oh, yeah, man. it's sad. It's, it's sad. sad, yeah. <laughs> it's it's good but bad. You're like, dang, I did it, but now it's like, when am now I going to have this big of a deer to chase again? It was really sad for the other guys that were hunting. <laughs> I, can, I can imagine. I was going to say, that was going to be my last question, is how did Jason take it? Yeah. <laughs> uh, Jason took it well. Jason was, Jason was very happy um, that I got him. Um, you know, he's a, he's a quality guy and he, uh, you know, he, he had no issue with it and he came down and saw it and, 
you know, he, I mean, he, you know, he gets it. It wasn't like I was hunting out of his stand or anything like that. So I feel like just know. being able to go and see the deer, would, yeah, that would give you some closure. You know what I mean? And then like a, a friend getting it would be cool. But like, it's just those deer that you get on trail camera, like that are absolute giants. You put all the work in and then they just disappear. Like you have no idea. It's just so yeah. devastating. And- and, you know, we all kind of share, you know, in the lease, we all kind of share pictures. Uh, you know, I share with guys what I'm seeing and, I, I, you know, I don't, we don't kind of go in on top of each other. And, you know, the spot I went into, you know, nobody, nobody had ever hunted it. Nobody was ever in there. And uh, um, so it wasn't like it was, you know, pushed in on top of somebody, but it just, it just kind of worked out that, and I kind of, you know, like I said, I, I had a feeling what that deer was doing. And when I snuck up there that morning in November and in that rain, and I got a video of him, I was like, Oh yeah, I, I, I might have a chance to kill this deer. Yeah. You get, then you're all, I would be amped as hell. Yeah, like, man, this thing is a giant. I kind of, <laughs> I got, you know, I had an encounter. You're, I bet you you're like, man, I wish I had just had my bow. Like, why didn't I have my bow when I had these trail cam pulling these trail cams? You know what I mean? That's another thing yeah. with the rain, man. The rain has something to do with these giant bucks. I don't know. Well, it, it, it was, and I mean, when I say it, it was pouring, it was just, it was an absolute just downpour. And I just looked up and saw antlers coming up over the ridge. And I thought, oh my gosh. And I just, just got down behind that tree and I got my phone out as quick as I could and started videoing because that's all, that's all I wanted to do was try to get a video of this deer. Yeah. Make show your buddies like, look how big this thing really is, man. Yeah, Fresh, yeah exactly. Freaking legend like, out there, yeah. you know. And we we've always had some, you know, we've had some great bucks on that property um, the last four or five years. But I mean, this one was just, you know, any. I mean, obviously, time you get over two hundred inches, I mean, it's just unbelievable, just unbelievable. Yeah, it's, it's just epic, unbelievable. Well, man, we appreciate you coming on and telling the story of Flair. Um, it was a good one, man. I love when you have all that history and you connect the dots. And congratulations again on getting it done. And I hope you can get it done on an even bigger one. It sounds like when we were talking before, you were kind of on another another nice one. So, so Yeah, uh, you know, this year was, uh, and I appreciate you guys having me, this year was a little slower for me. And I really didn't get anything on camera. I really wanted to hunt. And, uh, so I just, you know, this year was kind of a year that I just, you know, sat and enjoyed, you know, just enjoyed my time in the woods, but, you know, um, so we, I got another farm in Kentucky. I'm, I'm sort of trying to manage up. So, you know, I'm, I'm just waiting for my next big one to show up. I mean, you kill a 212, you can take a year off, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty solid for this next year. If, uh, uh, if yeah. I, if, if I had a dollar for everyone that said, well, you never top that one. I, I, I yeah, I've that. heard that too. You know I mean? I'm like, I, I got a lot of years left, man. Don't hold me back. You never know. Hey, m- I heard that after my 184. So, so, yeah, yeah. but you know, but yeah, it's a 184 like, typical is pretty giant. See, right. <laughs> so, yeah. And, and like I said, the, you know, just, it just, you know, good thing it was a great year it was a great hunt i'm just blessed to be able to harvest a deer like that the way it all kind of turned out on the first time in and but you know it, it comes down to spending time where the big bucks are at and you know if i continued hunting back here on our family farm in west virginia uh probably my biggest deer would be 115 inch eight point so you know it it, it, it it's all about you know it's all about hunting weather Yep, got to go where the big deer are at, man. That's, we say that all the time. You might have a piece, and there might be one decent buck on it all year, you know what I mean? But there's a piece out there that's got giants on it all year. You just got to find it. So Yeah. We always tell yeah. people, man, if you can get a 20, if you can get a 15, if you can look at another piece of public, if anything that you can pick up, you never know when your next giant is going to be on that piece. You just absolutely never know where these big deer hold up, so that's right and you know the county i live in back here you know a 130 is considered a giant in this county so you know it's all about you know, it's all about going you know going to where they're at yeah for sure all right man we'll wrap it up here uh appreciate you coming on and telling the story again all right thanks again guys i really enjoyed it that right there is what you call another burner, burner. episode of a legend 
Um, we love these legend episodes. We know uh, a lot of our listeners do. Um, we're going to continue to do them because we keep getting so much positive feedback. If you guys love these episodes, leave a comment. Um, let us know. Um, this right here had it all, man. Good story, history, giant buck, another small time guy getting it done. Little mystery too. Yeah, little mystery. Deer, no, deer was disappearing a little yeah, bit. I know. And then he shrunk one year, got bigger. Oh, I mean, man. epic That'd be stuff. Tough. So, and then the chocolate horn theory. Yeah, you know right. I mean? Kind of coinciding. Good, good, good discussion. But uh, um, I really enjoy these episodes, man. And and uh, it makes me really want to get back out in the woods you know? <laughs> no. it makes me want to find another giant to chase is what it wants me to do so but uh, we just want to thank you guys for listening keep hitting that play button try to leave a legacy and white to legacies out